welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church today on this Pentecost Sunday. We welcome you. Come to Jesus, you who are thirsty. Drink deeply of the Holy Spirit. Let your heart overflow with the living water that renews the face of the earth. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, like a rushing wind, your spirit moved upon the first disciples on the day of Pentecost. And like a purifying fire, your spirit seared their hearts and minds with the message of salvation. Send your spirit upon your church in this time and place. Stir up our courage and rouse us for a prophetic witness that we may join them in to proclaim to the world your mighty deeds of power in Jesus Christ. Amen. El Espíritu Santo desciende en Pentecosteses. Cuando llegó el día de Pentecosteses, estaban todos juntos en el mismo lugar. De repente, vino del cielo un ruido, como de una violenta ráfaga de viento, y llenó toda la casa donde estaban reunidos. Se les aparecieron entonces unas lenguas, como de fuego, que se repartieron y se posaron sobre cada uno de ellos. Todos fueron llenos del Espíritu Santo y comenzaron a hablar en diferentes lenguas, según el Espíritu les concedía expresarse. Quel giorno c'erano a Gerusalemme molti uomini timorati di Dio, venuti da tutte le parti del mondo per le celebrazioni religiose. Al sentire quel rumore, corsero a vedere e rimasero confusi, perché ciascuno sentiva i discepoli parlare nella propria lingua. Come può essere? esclamarono meravigliati. Ma questi che parlano non sono tutti della Galilea? At 2 des 12 a 15 Tous étaient stupéfaits et perplexes se disant Qu'est-ce que cela signifie? Mais d'autres ricaneront et diront, ils sont remplis de vin nouveau. Mais Pierre, debout avec les onze, éleva la voix et s'adressa à eux. Peuple de Judée et tous ceux qui vivent à Jérusalem, que cela vous soit connu et écoutez ce que je dis. En effet, ceux-ci ne sont pas ivres, comme vous le supposez, car il n'est que 9 heures du matin. Ima mite iru koto wa nan seki mo mae ni masa ni yougen sha yoeru ga yougen shita koto na no desu. Kami wa iwareru. Owari no hi ni Watashi wa subete no shito ni watashi no rei o sosoku. Sono toki anata gata no musuko, musume wa yougen shi, seinen wa maboroshi o mi, rojin wa yume o miru. Today's Gospel reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7 and 12 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, 
they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord.
Our sermon today is out of the believer's heart based on the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. So let me read that scripture for us to begin with. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray for understanding as we come to this time of focusing on your word for us. May it speak in our hearts today in ways that will help us to live our discipleship more fully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is Pentecost Sunday. I hope you're wearing your red pajamas or sweatshirt or something else red uh, while you're worshiping at home today. Pentecost is one of those fun celebratory days in the season of the church year uh, where we expect some surprises when we come to church which is completely understandable when you're dealing with a day on which the Holy Spirit is said to have come through the community of believers on that first Pentecost like a mighty rush of wind, filling them and renewing them with life-giving power. You may wonder what this story has to do with us today. How does the Pentecost experience affect us? How are our lives shaped and guided by the Spirit of Christ that fills us? Kingdom people are people who are born of water and the Spirit, according to John's Gospel. In our baptisms, we talk about being given new birth through water and the Spirit. Let's face it, whether we fully understand it or not, God is trying to do something new in us when we take the, that first step and begin to walk through life, having been baptized into a new way of life the way of Jesus, the way of nonviolent love and courageous generosity. At our baptisms, with the cool wetness of the water spilling over us and awakening us to something stirring within our souls, even if we can't fully understand it, and we usually don't, we are drawn into the mystery of the triune God. Then as the pastor and others place their hands upon us in that ancient sign of blessing, the following words are spoken over us. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And the people respond, Amen. May it be so. And with those words, and with that ritual action, the community of faith enfolds our lives and commits itself to our spiritual growth and we begin the adventure of faith that will last a lifetime. I am fortunate to have a memory of my own baptism conducted my, by my granddad, the Reverend Norval Richardson, an ordained minister, when I was 12 years old. There was no mistaking the water at my baptism either, as I was standing waist deep in it, uh, and before long, I was completely immersed in it. The amount of water, though, is not what is significant in baptism, nor the age of the person, but rather the promise that comes alive in that moment, God's promise of new birth. Baptism is about forming a people. It's not so much an individual act, it's a, a community act that, that helps to form this people, a community that lives out through its life together the promise of God that all things are becoming new. I begin this sermon speaking of baptism because it is that moment that indelibly defines the beginning of our Christian life. It is more than ritual or sacrament. It is more than means of grace. It is more than even covenant. It is the beginning of what God will do in and through us, transforming our lives, making us new. The congregation says in the baptism liturgy, 
As we welcome new sisters and brothers in Christ, we say through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. This has been an awful week, a troubling week in our nation. We have seen the number of deaths due to the coronavirus exceed 100,000, a grim milestone. Not everyone, of course, knows someone who has personally, uh, who has died, but we do know that each one of these 100,000 people had families and friends and others who loved them and relied upon them. The ripple effects of losing each one of these souls will be felt for generations. It is staggering, and it is not over. Among the most troubling dimensions to me of this pandemic is how it has exposed the inequities and injustices in our society. We knew poverty was a problem for millions of Americans, and now many more are in danger of slipping into poverty through the loss of employment or illness. The health challenges associated with chronic poverty place many of the very same people at far greater risk if exposed to the virus. And while people from all walks of life are susceptible, people of color are disproportionately harmed by this disease, in large part because of how health, education, and other resources are unequally distributed throughout our society. This week has also been a, a horribly tragic week because it has again exposed the systemic racism that plagues so many of our society's institutions. As Bishop Bruce O. wrote in his letter to the Minnesota Annual Conference this week, he said, quote, in addition to fighting COVID-19, we are besieged by a pandemic of racism, white supremacy, and white on black or brown violence. The tragic racially charged and unnecessary death of George Floyd at the hands of four Minneapolis police officers is only the latest flare up of this pandemic. And Mr. Floyd is only the latest victim. The list of black lives who have been needlessly killed grows each day, unquote. This time, it was George Floyd. History suggests that there will be a next time and a time after that. African Americans are so regularly the victims of unjustified, unprovoked, unforgivable police violence that it would be willful blindness to think that a pattern so entrenched will suddenly cease. Aaron Hawkins, General Secretary of the United Methodist General Commission on Religion and Race, says that the church is being presented with a divine invitation to face the pain points of racial violence and oppression, to see the realities of a denomination still mired, still mired in institutional racism reflected in the assault of black and brown personhood. And finally, to choose once and for all the path of anti-racism in word and deed. She argues that Jesus called his disciples to leave everything behind and follow him. She says Jesus then led those who accepted the call to places where marginalization had rendered people sick, hungry, and burdened. And there Jesus challenged systems, offered healing touch, and brought life to the dying and dead. He disrupted the status quo in order to be and to bring good news to those outside the systems of power. Christ invites us to leave behind the comforts of power and privilege that lure us away from following him to uncomfortable places and instead to move with intentionality toward the pain points in our local congregations, our communities, denomination, and the world. Only then will we effectively interrupt narratives that defend and accommodate and 
uh, support racist behavior. Only then will we finally dismantle the systems that perpetuate, protect, and normalize the racism made evident through recent events like the one in Minneapolis. She finishes her article with this challenge to us as we celebrate Pentecost and the miracle that happens when the wind of the Holy Spirit blows new life through a gathering of believers. What shall we, the community of faith, make of this opportunity to be transformed anew by the breath of God, even as we are simultaneously confronted by the image of one of God's children pinned to the ground begging for life and exclaiming, I can't breathe. Bishop O issued a vigor, vigorous call to action. He said, now it is our responsibility as persons of faith and particularly as followers of Jesus in the Methodist tradition to address the pervasive pandemic of racism. We are compelled to address this pandemic with the same intensity and intentionality with which we are addressing COVID-19. We begin, he says, by acknowledging that racism is sin and antithetical to the gospel. We confess and denounce our own complicity. We take a stand against any and all expressions of racism and white supremacy, beginning with the racial, cultural, and class disparities in our state and country that are highlighted by the coronavirus pandemic. We sound the clarion call for the eradication of racism. We challenge governmental leaders who fan the flames of racial division for political gain. We examine our own attitudes and actions. All change begins with transformed hearts, he says, continually yielding to the righteousness and love of God. This brings us back to our text in John's Gospel that I read earlier. It is set in the Jewish, in the context of the Jewish festival of tabernacles at the temple in Jerusalem. The significance of the feast in Jesus' day was about remembering God's provision for the people of Israel during their wilderness years. For each of the eight days of the festival, priests would would draw water from the pool of Siloam in a golden pitcher. They would lead a procession from the pool to the temple and pour out the water in the temple. These actions served as a reminder of the water from the rock in the desert recorded in the book of Numbers and as a symbol of hope for the coming messianic deliverance they expected. The water used in the ritual actions was was highly symbolic, and, and it was within this context of, of one of the most important Jewish festivals at a time when Jesus' life was at danger on the final day, the great day, that Jesus cries out in a loud voice so that everyone there could hear, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. Here at this festival that celebrates God's provision in the wilderness, Jesus offers the living water that quenches all thirst and is a source of life eternal. Friends, there is so much thirst in our world today. Everywhere you turn, there is someone thirsty for clean water, thirsty for friendship, thirsty for, for food to feed their families, for food security, thirsty for justice, thirsty for hope, how do followers of Jesus today respond to these thirsts? How are we involved in extending Jesus' invitation to come and drink from living waters? Here's the amazing news presented in this gospel. This is the surprising news of today, this Pentecost Sunday. Are you ready? When we take our deepest thirsts to Christ, our own deepest thirsts, we ourselves, John says, become rivers of life. He says, out of believers' hearts shall flow rivers of living water. 
Thomas Long points out, when thirsty people come to Jesus, he does not merely hand them a spiritual beverage, momentary relief for thirst. He gives them instead the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit, believers participate in the unceasing life of God, and the water of abundant life flows and flows through them. We often get stuck after tragic events. In the words of Reverend James Howell, asking ourselves the innocuous question, what can one person do? What can one person do? He says the powerful secret of a democracy is that one person actually does matter. So a few questions for us individuals who plead feeling overwhelmed and unable. Whom do you vote for and why? Where do you hang out? What streets do you walk down? Whom do you have real relationships with? Have you phoned anybody? Have you probed deeply into yourself to detect white privilege and unnoticed bias? He goes on to say that the answer to what can one person do is everything. Look at your whole life, he says, and ask questions. Keep asking questions. Converse with others, not the day after a death, but three weeks later. Name injustice everywhere. You are a baptized child of God. You are born and called to become a river of life for someone who is thirsty today. Let all who have ears hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen.
God on this Pentecost Sunday. We come to celebrate, to give thanks, to anticipate, to pray for a new Pentecost, a new birth into a new beginning. The winds of change are blowing. Your spirit moved human hearts down through the ages. On Pentecost, that spark was ignited by the winds of your Holy Spirit, moving them from their upper rooms. And so blow, Holy Spirit, blow once more. Rekindle and spread your love like wildfire far and wide to enliven what is cold, hard, dead, to revive our faith, to inspire our words and actions, to meld together our divisions fanned in the flames of Pentecost. The winds of change are blowing. Let them blow here. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray today for all those in upper rooms of pain, feeling like all the wind has been knocked out of them, trying to catch their breath, gasping for fresh air, imprisoned by fears, grief, and confusion, teetering between hope and despair, waiting for something, some word, some sign, some glimpse of light in their darkness. God, open a window for a gust to flow into the upper rooms of their lives. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray for the grieving who've lost loved ones in the pandemic, for those in neighborhoods and housing that is not safe, disproportionate suffering, tragic profiling. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray for those who are sick and recovering, for those brave souls who walk the hospital hallways providing medical care, for those caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for all who are helping and so very weary, for those who can't even get in to see their loved ones, and those who are feeling alone and isolated, come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray for those working long days to provide food, shelter, care, and comfort in our society these days, for leaders whose words and actions rally the best in the human spirit, who are trustworthy and true in the face of such life and death policies and decisions. We pray for students and families whose schools, graduations, and prospects have all been shaken. God, the needs are so great, and so we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. God, let your spirit blow a new wind through our souls. We need your power of renewal when we tire of the hard work of discipleship. Break us loose from our separate upper rooms. Overcome and then use our differences, speaking truth to power, straining for a better way, setting priorities, being intentional about the work you have called us to do in the world, holding steady through the storm winds, the ups and downs, joys and sorrows, successes and setbacks. Renew your spark in us. Reignite the flames of our love with a compassion that unites us. The winds of change are blowing. Burst the confines. Thrust us out into a waiting, hurting, divided world. Come, Holy Spirit, with rushing wind that sweeps away all barriers. Come, Holy Spirit, with tongues of fire that set our hearts aflame. Come, Holy Spirit, with speech that unites the babble of our tongues. Come, Holy Spirit, with love that overleaps the boundaries of orientation, race, and nation. Come, Holy Spirit with power from above to make our weakness strong. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon the heads and the hearts of those who call themselves by Christ's name, that your church may live again with the Spirit of Christ. And in his prayer of discipleship, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We've come to the time for our offering, and I just want to say thank you to all of you for continuing your support of the ministries of the church. Uh, so many of you are keeping up very well, and uh, we so appreciate that. Let us offer this prayer of thanksgiving for opening your hand and blessing us with your manifold blessings. We give you thanks, O oh God. On this day of Pentecost, may our gifts bring dreams and visions to a world in need of hope and direction. And may our hearts overflow with rivers of living water. Amen. Again, thank you for being in worship with us this morning. And as I do from time to time, I offer a Franciscan blessing, uh, one of my favorite blessings. And this seems like an appropriate time for that. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice oppression and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Oh,